Sal, I one of the reasons I really wanted to have you on this week is that uh, I was really fascinated by what I saw in the Jets Eagles game on Sunday. And I don't want to talk necessarily just about the game, but I want to talk about the Eagles. Okay. And I thought the game was really, really interesting from a lot of different standpoints, but one of which was the standpoint of Jalen Hurts. And I have been overwhelmingly impressed with Jalen Hurts over the last couple of years. Uh, You know, I got to talk to him a few times. I, in no way would I ever say that I know him because I don't. Um, But I've talked to him a few times, obviously watched him, uh, talked to Nick Sirianni a lot about him. And I've been totally impressed with him. But at the end of that game, uh, against the Jets when he threw the interception to Tony Adams that led to New York scoring the winning touchdown. Uh, it was very interesting. The TV cameras focused on him on the sidelines probably three or four times for an extended period each time. And he looked... I I mean, it might be too strong a word to say he looked defeated, but he looked different than I've seen him on the sidelines after, you know, late in games or during games where he's looking at the tablet or he's engaging with coaches, whatever. Um, He really seemed to be affected by that game against the Jets and by that loss. You were there. You were on the scene. What did you see? What did you feel? Well, I think it manifested itself after the game. I think you're right. I think it did have an impact on him that was different, Peter. And you could see it on his face. And after the game, before Nick Sirianni said a word to the team, the locker room doors are closed. Nick Sirianni doesn't say anything, doesn't have a chance to say anything. And Jalen Hurts gets up in front of his teammates and says, it's on me, takes full accountability for what happened in the game. Uh, that, uh, for in my, for my knowledge, I don't, I don't ever remember that happening in the Jalen Hurts, Nick Sirianni era. Right. So, so that, that was very telling. And then AJ Brown spoke and uh, some other players But, you know, those are the two offensive leaders, A.J. Brown and Jalen Hurts. And I think you're right. I think it did have an impact on him. But I think there's so many things about that game, so many dynamics, big and little, that are important to talk about when you're talking about a team that's trying to get back to the Super Bowl after losing a Super Bowl, which, as we know, is very hard to do. You – we're in training camp. You may have been there the day that Nick Sirianni said that the metrics and the analytics that they looked at in the offseason, they have a very big analytics department, and they looked and looked and looked and investigated what are the factors that really impact a team not getting back to the Super Bowl. And there are two of them. And then not tough to figure out. Number one is a fall off in offensive production. And number two is injuries. And the Eagles have been victimized by both of those things. And they sometimes go hand in hand. You know, they were not going to go 17 and 0. Right. But, But what happened yesterday, I think, is indicative of this trend that sort of bugs teams that are trying to get back to the Super Bowl. There were eight starters of the 22 that started the season that weren't on the field at the end of that game. Most important, the right tackle, Lane Johnson. Now, you and I sit in the Hall of Fame selection committee room every year. You've been there for three decades. I've been there for one. Um, Lane Johnson is, to me, the Mariano Rivera of right tackles. So since he started with the Philadelphia Eagles, when he's in the starting lineup, their winning percentage is 631. When he's not in the starting lineup, their winning percentage drops to 360, which is amazing. 
That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, we like Jack Driscoll. We think he's a good player, but we're talking about a guy who's probably going to Canton in Lane Johnson. And I think, you know, he was on Jalen Hurts was under more pressure than he was all of last season in this in this game. I think Robert Sala did a great job and the rest of that defensive staff of mixing in different coverages and blitzes. They fooled Jalen Hurts, obviously, on the last interception. Kudos to Tony Adams and a great job by the staff. But in the end, you know, they were trying to help Jack Tristow on the right side when Lane Johnson went down in the four, in the first quarter, and that was not good enough, and he was constantly under pressure, and you could see it. Dan Orlovsky did a really good job of breaking it down on Get up this morning on ESPN with Mike Greenberg talking about his body language in the pocket, how his shoulders and head were slumped, and how he was drifting in the pocket as a result of the pressure. You know, you it, you you get weird, worn down when you get hit and under pressure. Yeah, you you just do. But again, they weren't going to go seventeen and one. Uh they got to get healthier, and uh, they. They've got to get more productive on offense. Do you think there is anything else that when you watch the Eagles right now that I don't even want to say alarms you, but that you think is concerning to you as you see them try to make another run toward a Super Bowl? Pass defense for sure. They've had a rash of injuries in the secondary so far. They've been able to hold up okay. But, you know, uh, Zach Wilson's not Patrick Mahomes. He's not Josh Allen. He's not Brock Purdy. And they still have some really difficult games up ahead. Uh, Seattle, Geno Smith, that, that offense is definitely more potent than the Jets. So they've had some injuries in the secondary. You know, they lost their number one slot corner, Avante Maddox, to a bicep injury for the season. He may be one of the best slot corners in the NFL. He's definitely yeah. in the top five or six, and he's gone. And they tried the experiment of moving Bradbury in. They signed Bradley Roby, who's, a you know, a competent player, a good player, an experienced player, a tough player. Um, but Avante Max Maddox was a difference maker. Jalen Carter wasn't on the field. And Jalen Carter was their number one dis disruptor in the interior defensive line. Uh, these are explanations and excuses, but the bottom line is, Peter, you look at you look at the stat sheet, and I did this on SportsCenter last night. The Eagles had more first downs in the game, more total net yards, more passing yards, more gross passing yards. Yeah. I mean, it's not even close. They had half as many penalties as the Jets. They gave the game away with four turnovers. Yeah. So Yeah, I think I think so. I'm I'm you know, when I watch them now, I watched a you know, last year toward the end of the year and I'm thinking about particularly the Giants game in the playoffs. Uh, and in the Super Bowl, and and obviously somewhat also against the 49ers, this team was unstoppable on offense. And I think what I what I what I miss seeing right now on offense is that great confidence that they had, and the great confidence that I had in them uh, as they were going through it. And again, look. Bill Parcells had a famous saying every year when he get to training camp, he would say, you never pick up one year, positive or negative, where you left off the previous year. So every year is a new year. You've got to come out and play great that year. No one is thinking about what you did last January. And so that's what I think of when I watch the Eagles now, that they've got a battle to get back to where they were in the last three or four games last season. That's sort of how I see it. You know, and that confidence starts with their offensive line. 
And they're missing both their right tackle and right guard, starting right tackle and right guard. You know, Jalen Hurts coming into the game against the Jets, Peter, was already the most blitz quarterback in the NFL, 41% of the time. Wow. So the way they were defeating the blitz was superior offensive line play. You couldn't rush four against the Eagles because if you did, the offensive line would hold up. You had to come after him. Once Lane Johnson went out of the game on Sunday, then it was open season with Robert Sala's defense. They only yeah. they yeah. only blitz 19% of the time, the Jets. They rush for 81% of the time and expect to hold up on the back end or at least, you know, through deception, get to you. And once Johnson went out and they just opened up the floodgates and they were after Jalen Hurts, And that was the real difference maker to me in the game, for sure. Now, Miami, they also don't blitz that much. But Miami's got a track meet. Yeah. And the Eagles have to, you know, figure out what they're going to do in their secondary. Because, you know, McDaniel doesn't have to scheme up very much. I know he – I realize he he learned from Kyle. uh, And they have a sophisticated running game. But when you can beat one-on-one matchups continually with nine routes like they did the last two, three games, this is a big test for the Eagles secondary now in this game against Miami. Yeah. So going into this game, and I want to turn it to the Jets after this, but going into this game, I think the interesting part is that, you know, the Eagles – Now, I mean, I always thought that last year the Eagles pass offense had a huge edge over uh, the foes that they played. And that's how it turned out during the year. But this year, it's almost it's almost even. In fact, you know, the you know, if anything, the opposition is getting better production, 11 touchdown passes two interceptions versus for the Eagles, seven and seven. Mm-hmm. Uh, better passer rating for the opponents than the Eagles have this year. But look, a lot of this is, as you say, because you know their offensive line has been in flux and now you may have to play a game or two or however many without Lane Johnson. And, you know, and obviously that's going to be an issue. But look, every great team has to deal with injuries and has to deal with adversity. And to have the Miami Dolphins coming in and knowing that if you're on the offense now, if you're Jalen Hurts approaching this game, honestly, you know, he has got to be thinking, I got to score in the 30s for us to have a really good chance to win this game because Miami's going to score in the 30s, you know, against almost anybody. So I I think I think this is a great, fun, very interesting matchup. And, And Sal, as somebody who lives in Philadelphia and who has watched the Philadelphia Phillies take advantage of a gigantic home field advantage in the baseball playoffs. I always think that if you see a game at Citizens Bank Park or a Lincoln Financial Field, that that has to mean something. You've covered a thousand games over the years there. You've been to a thousand sports events in Philly. Tell me if you can what it means to the opposing team to have that crowd in the game the way it is. Well, all you have to do is look at the face of the brave shortstop who was getting worn out in the dugout by the Phillies fans. That tells you everything you need to know. You know, Peter, when you come to Lincoln Financial Field, you stand in the visitor's tunnel. I always go to the visitor's tunnel. I want to hear what the fans are saying to those visiting players as they're coming on and off the field. 
you know, we don't roll the camera because we can't put any of it on television. <laughs> There's no sense in rolling the camera. Where are we going to play it? Yeah. But I want to hear it and I want to feel it because it's, it's, um, you know, it's rough. Yeah. And it's rough. It's passionate. You know, uh, Rob Thompson was quoted recently as saying he talked to another major league manager who told him going to Citizens Bank ballpark is like three hours of pure hell. <laughs> I really like that. It, it really is. And, you know, yeah. and the fans are knowledgeable, passionate, tough, unforgiving, and uh, loyal. So loyal. You got to yeah. remember the Phillies were the only franchise in North America that had 10,000 losses in the 20th century. God. And you got to realize the Eagles watched 12 Super Bowl titles in the NFC East before they won one. And wow. yet the Lincoln Financial Field, the PSL sold out instantaneously. The place is always packed. Phillies fans never gave up, always show up. They show up with their time and their money while they open their wallets. Yeah, and, and and they pass it down from generation to generation. You know, like Boston for sure. It's not like yeah. New York, you know, because New York has two teams for every sport. It's more. It's a. It's, it's like Boston. Yeah. Sal, let's say two things about the New York Jets. So, okay, I was I was really impressed with the Jets' performance in this game, and clearly. That is one oppressive defense. That defensive front seven is so good and so pressure packed that they were able to make up for the loss of the top three corners that they have, you know, on their team, which they didn't find out they were going to be missing them until Friday and Saturday uh, of, of, of the game week. Give me your impression watching the Jets of whether they might be able to hold it together and make a playoff run. I I would invite anybody, including you, to just watch the Jets defense on tape. Go back and just look at the Jets defense and watch number 56, Quincy Williams. Yeah. He personifies ferocity. Speed, power, and 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 just ferocious play. Yeah. And, you know, so Robert Sala said that Aaron Rodgers' superpower is his presence. Well, Robert Sala is not giving himself enough credit. I arrived yesterday at MetLife Stadium on Sunday at MetLife Stadium for a 425 game at 8 a.m. because I was live on one of our shows at 9 a.m. Robert Sala began running the steps at MetLife Stadium by himself at 9 a.m. Think about that, Peter. That's seven hours, seven and a half hours before kickoff. So we get done with our live shots. We go up to the press box, we have one more hit at around, I think it was like 11, 1130. Salah's in round two of doing the steps, lower bowl. Didn't want to just do one, did another one. And the, I think his superpower is the way he just has so much energy. He comes yeah. to the stadium with so much energy gets on the sideline and delivers energy. He's yeah. It's like he's one of the players, and the players feed off of that. I mean, he's part architect, I get it. His D coordinator is a very good D coordinator, but the way he engages the players. The first guy I went to after the game to interview wasn't Zach Wilson. It wasn't Brees Hall. It was C.J. Mosley. You know, it's an old trick I used to go after Bart Scott. Remember the Bart Scott interview? Yeah, always go, yeah. always go for the linebackers because they have 
they have that adrenaline still coursing through their veins. It, it, you know, it, it takes a while for it really to subside. You want to get that energy on camera. So I go to C.J. Mosley and I said, you were the one who said it before the game that if we're going to go anywhere, we got to start beating teams like this. And then he just went off. And I think that a lot of that comes from Robert Sala. I think his superpower is the energy he brings to that stadium, to that field, to that team, especially on defense. You that's have more, that's probably more than you wanted, Peter. But no, that's my it opinion. was good. It was a good scene. Do you have a a gut feeling or any opinion whatsoever? on the state of Aaron Rodgers' rehab and whether he might be able to play football before the end of this season. Here's my observation. You know Aaron Rodgers better than I do. You've interviewed him many more times than I have. My view from afar is that Aaron Rodgers is different than when he was in Green Bay that he is engaged on a personal level in a way that he was not there. And that's not to say that he wasn't. I think he's just turned up the heat, turned up the volume of it, turned yeah. up the intensity. The engagement is there. You can see it with the players. Him just being on the sideline, throwing before the game on the field, you know, it was snap, crackle, pop, baby. It was real. Yeah. You know, it was, you could feel it. The buzz. He got on the field and the reporters left the press box and everybody went over to take pictures. You know, it was like Paul McCartney walked out on the field with a guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I've talked to a couple of people uh, in the medical fraternity who say that look it should be should be very very unlikely that you can come back in less than five months from an achilles but they say two things number one dr neil elatrash is really cutting edge guy on a lot of surgeries a lot of orthopedic surgeries and so if anybody is going to come up with a way to expedite that process, it'd be him. And I think the second thing is, I forget the name of the exact procedure, but in most uh, Achilles tears, what the surgeon will do is he will reattach the Achilles and basically it'll be like the, the number one. You know, it'll be, it'll be one piece. And it will be attached like that. Well, imagine that there is an X, okay? Like a narrow X. And that is how Dr. Neil Ella Trash attached the Achilles to Aaron Rodgers, which means that there are now four sutures, okay? Two on the top, two on the bottom that they used to reattach his Achilles. And look, I'm not saying that it's going to mean anything because I don't know. All I know is that 32 days after he had this surgery, Aaron Rodgers was walking without a boot, walking without crutches and throwing a football fairly normally. So you ask yourself, okay, if he does that in one month, what about three months? What happens? Could he play week 17, week 18? And again, I am in no way suggesting he will. I am just suggesting that I don't think it's impossible, and we'll see. No, I don't think it's impossible. Um, but I'm not going to sit here and, you know, conjecture about his medical right. condition. I just – not qualified, don't know what's happening really behind the scenes right. with him and his doctor. Yeah. Have no idea. What I'm what I'm suggesting to you is that just by being there, he's definitely having an impact on the football team. 
And yeah. that's and that's an important part for him to play. And I think a lot of it de- it will be determined, in my opinion, my opinion only, about whether he gets back on the field, about is he needed, right? Is he needed? Can he make a difference? Uh, you know, it's it's one thing to walk around and throw a football. It's another thing to get out of the way of the rush. Yes. Agreed. <clears throat> yep. So we'll see. I wish him the best. I hope he gets back as soon as possible. And uh, I hope he gets back to playing at a high level. It's good for everybody if he does. The Jets, Aaron Rodgers, the people who watch football, the people who cover football, it's good for everybody. No question about it. Sal Palantonio, listen, thanks so much for taking time. Really appreciate it. Love watching you. Love uh, your knowledge. And thanks so much for enriching my podcast this week. Peter, thanks for having me. It's really been a pleasure. And, uh, you know, your friendship means so much to me. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.